So welcome to DNA. This is going to be a chapter about how DNA replicates and what DNA is made of and also the experiments that they did to figure out where DNA even comes from and where it's stored and those types of things. So if you look here, we've got your notes and the first little part here is talking about different experiments that had occurred. I apologize, my dog is playing with her toy and it's the only thing keeping them quiet. Um, so the first um, one that we're going to talk about is going to be this one. This is the Hammerling experiment. And what this is showing is how they proved that DNA was in the nucleus. So what they did was they actually had these two types of algae that were unicellular algae. And you can see they each have like kind of a root area, a stalk, and a cap. And what they did is they actually cut it into three pieces and, um, you know, tried to do different experiments. So one thing that they did is they took the um, bottom part where they knew the nucleus was and they put the stalk of the other type of species on it and what they found was that the cap that grew at the top resembled the one um, that the nucleus came from at the bottom and then vice versa with the other one. So this just kind of gave us the evidence that yes, there is going to be some type of genetic material in the nucleus. Now, the next one is going to be the Briggs and King experiment. Um, and this is going to kind of be how they prove that um, all of the instructions for something are going to be in the nucleus. So what they did was they actually used frog embryos. So you can see in this picture here, uh, if I can make it bigger. And what they did is they actually took the nucleus out of a developing um, zygote and when they did that, everything just kind of stopped, right? So none of the development happened at all. Then when they took a nucleus and put it back in that same one, all of a sudden it would develop into an adult. So that gave them the evidence that the nucleus contained genetic instructions that were important for development. Okay. Now, the um, next one that we're going to talk about is going to be the Griffith experiment. And this one, it's re really helpful to kind of have some sort of explanation because some people get um, a little confused with it. So here it is and let's talk about how this works. All right, so what you see in this, these pictures here are going to be a type of bacteria that causes blood poisoning. The only time it can cause that blood poisoning is if it has this harmful coating around it. Okay, so that's just a mutant strain of the bacteria. So what they did is they knew that this one would cause blood poisoning and so they injected mice with it and the mice died. Then what they did is they had that other strain that did not have that protein coating on it that was the lethal part and they injected the mice with it and what they found was the mice were fine because it was that protein coating that these guys didn't have that made them toxic. Then on this third one what they did is they took the harmful one that previously killed those mice and they heat killed it so it was dead and they injected the mice with it and as you can imagine the mice were fine because the bacteria were not alive. Maggie, Maggie, relax, sorry. Um, then the last thing that they did was they actually took the heat killed one and the one that didn't have that protein coat. Now let's look before we go any further. Here's the heat killed one, the mice were fine. Here's the one without the protein coat and those are fine. But when they mixed them together, what happened was the mice died. So they were confused, and so what they did is they actually took blood from the dead mice, and they found living ones that had that protein coat on it. So that should strike you as kind of weird, because that is not what they injected them with. And so that backs up the idea that bacteria can do something called transformation, which is where they can actually steal genes from one another. And um, that's like maybe one of the big sources for antibiotic resistance that we see today. So transformation is kind of a cool thing that there were some experiments on as well. All right. Then we have the Avery and the Hershey Chase experiments. <clears throat> and so these, whoops, <laughs> these were actually trying to um, look that DNA was the her hereditary material and that it wasn't protein because they still didn't really know. And so what they did with that is they actually used viruses in order to do this. So the way a virus works is um, in this picture, let me make it a little bigger so you can see it. Um, a virus is going to click onto a cell, that's what this big part is right here. And if you look, a virus is very simple, it's just going to be made of DNA and protein. So the protein in this picture is pink and the DNA is black. And so what they did is they um, actually radioactively labeled the protein. <laughs> Ladies! Hey! Enough! 
Sorry about that. Um, so what they did is they labeled the protein, and what happened was they um, actually were able to spin off all of the different components from when that occurred. And hey, girls, those are my dogs. Aren't they great? Um, and then what they actually could do was they could see that the DNA was going to be what the virus is injecting into the cells, and that's the important part. OK. So that's it as far as the experiments go, and we can go over that a little bit more in lab as well. Um, then in the next video, we're going to get into the actual structure of DNA.